Apollo 7, the first manned flight in this nation's Apollo program, was launched from Complex 34, Kennedy Space Center, Florida, on October 11, 1968. This was the first mission for the improved version of the command and service modules of the Apollo spacecraft and the fifth launch of a two-stage Saturn 1B vehicle. The primary objectives of this first manned Apollo mission were to demonstrate the command, service module, and crew performance through extensive operational checkouts of the environmental control, guidance and navigation, and service propulsion systems. The command service module rendezvous capability by performing a simulated transposition and docking maneuver using the spacecraft lunar module adapter attached to the second stage. And the performance of the crew, space vehicle, and mission support facilities during a manned command service module mission in order to acquire and evaluate the aspects of a long duration space flight of up to 11 days. The three-man crew for this mission was outfitted in the new Apollo spacesuit. Astronaut Walter M. Schirra, a veteran of the Mercury and Gemini programs, was command pilot for the mission. Don F. Isley was command module pilot, and Walter Cunningham, lunar module pilot. Since Apollo 7 was a low Earth orbit mission, and the crew was restricted to working inside the spacecraft, the extravehicular suit hardware was not included for this mission. The launch time and date for Apollo 7 were established in early August and were maintained for two and one half months without change. The countdown was conducted by the manned launch operations team of the Kennedy Space Center. At the Marshall Space Flight Center, continuous monitoring of the Saturn 1B performance was conducted during countdown, liftoff, and flight. At the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, Texas, personnel in the Mission Control Center prepared to take over control of the launch vehicle and spacecraft following liftoff. Communications with Apollo 7 was maintained through the Manned Space Flight Network, a worldwide ground operational support systems network composed of 14 fixed stations. These were supplemented by mobile stations, which included four instrumented tracking ships, and five Apollo range instrumented aircraft. For the first time, the network operated in a fully remote situation with all spacecraft commands originating at mission control. The Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland received and processed network data for mission control and other applicable stations. At T minus two and one half hours, the flight crew arrived at the launch pad. They proceeded to the top of the launch tower and prepared to board the Apollo 7 spacecraft. In the white room, each of the astronauts was assisted in adjusting his spacesuit hardware and entering the spacecraft. As the countdown proceeded, the launch director ordered the spacecraft hatch closed. At T minus 33 minutes, the Apollo access arm was moved from the spacecraft. At this time, the cabin contained a mixed gas atmosphere of oxygen and nitrogen. Fifteen minutes before liftoff, the command service module was switched to internal power. The countdown proceeded smoothly until T minus six minutes, 15 seconds, when a two minute and 45 second hold was called to allow complete chill down of the second stage engine. This problem apparently was caused by a sticking valve in the ground support equipment. No further problems were encountered, and at T-minus 2 minutes 43 seconds, the automatic sequencer took over the count. Ignition of the eight first stage engines occurred at T-minus 3 seconds. As the engine thrust built up, high-speed cameras recorded the release of the hold-down arms and the tail service masts. At first movement of the space vehicle, the umbilical arms disconnected and were pulled back to the launch tower. 1,600,000 pounds of thrust lifted Apollo 7 from the launch pad at 2 minutes 45 seconds past 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. 10 seconds after liftoff, the roll and pitch maneuver was initiated to achieve a flight azimuth 
of 72 degrees. The astronauts reported all systems functioning as planned as Apollo 7 rose into space. Two minutes, 20 seconds into the flight, the first stage inboard engines shut down. Four seconds later, the outboard engines shut down. Stage separation followed at T plus two minutes, 25 seconds. Four seconds later, the second stage ignited to propel itself and the spacecraft into a 122 by 151 nautical mile orbit, extremely close to nominal. The launch escape system was jettisoned at T plus two minutes, 44 seconds, as the second stage engine continued to burn for seven minutes, 49 seconds. At T plus 10 minutes and 26 seconds, orbital insertion was attained. Telemetry and voice communications with the crew confirmed that all spacecraft systems were functioning as programmed. At 55 minutes ground elapsed time, the crew removed their helmets and gloves. As the second stage in the command and service module approached the United States at the end of the first revolution, the remaining second stage propellants and cold gases were vented in order to make the stage safe for rendezvous. During the second revolution, at two hours and 55 minutes ground elapsed time, the spacecraft separated from the second stage. The crew then pitched the spacecraft 180 degrees so that the command module faced the second stage. The transposition was nominal and was followed by a simulated docking exercise which brought the spacecraft to within five feet of the second stage. While station keeping with the second stage, the astronauts photographed the deployed panels of the spacecraft lunar module adapter. One of the panels did not fully deploy. A planned phasing maneuver using the service module reaction control system took place at three hours, 30 minutes. This maneuver was to compensate for the difference in the drag between the two vehicles and set up the proper phasing for the rendezvous maneuver planned to occur about 23 hours later. In tracking the two vehicles, mission control determined that the phasing burn had not provided the separation ranges anticipated and inserted a second burn into the mission plan. At 15 hours, 22 minutes, the second phasing burn of the service module reaction control system was initiated to place the spacecraft at the proper range to begin the rendezvous maneuver. A few minutes before the phasing burn, Commander Shira reported a head cold. The cold virus eventually spread to the other crew members. While causing some discomfort for the crew, it did not affect the mission plan. During the 17th orbit, on the second day of the mission, with the spacecraft 84 nautical miles ahead of the second stage, a 10-second burn of the service propulsion system was initiated with the spacecraft at a 70-degree angle facing the Earth. The burn placed the spacecraft into a co-elliptical orbit transferring the spacecraft above and behind the second stage. At this point, a second SPS burn in the co-elliptical maneuver placed the spacecraft below and behind the second stage and moving in on the target. At the completion of this maneuver, the Apollo 7 crew began optical tracking of the second stage. Maneuvers performed up to this time were based on ground computed data. When the line of sight angle to the second stage reached 27.45 degrees, a 17 feet per second terminal phase initiation burn was made using the service module reaction control system. The braking approach began when the spacecraft was about one mile from the second stage. The crew then maneuvered to within 70 feet of the tumbling stage. During a station keeping exercise of about 30 minutes, maneuvering was accomplished using the reaction control system engine. During the 20th revolution, as the spacecraft passed over the United States, the crew made a small posigrade maneuver using the service module RCS and broke off the rendezvous. Optical tracking of the second stage was maintained at various distances. On the third day of the mission, the second stage was tracked by the astronauts from 120 nautical miles. The second stage subsequently tumbled in a decaying orbit below and ahead of the spacecraft. It re-entered the atmosphere on October 18th and splashed into the Indian Ocean. Later on the third day, 
During the 48th revolution, the service propulsion system was fired for the third time. This 10 second burn changed orbital parameters from 159 by 122 nautical miles to 160 by 90 nautical miles. During the fourth day, the first lunar module rendezvous radar test was attempted, but the results were inconclusive. The test was run again on the next pass with good results. Landmark tracking also occupied the crew during the fourth day. At this time, they reported fogging on the inner side of the outer hatch panel. However, this was minor in nature and did not preclude photography and other activities. A radiation heat rejection degradation test was conducted throughout the morning of the fourth day. The test proved the capabilities of the radiator, in particular, that it could operate in a deep space environment. Hey, we got you. I can see Isley talking there. Hey, Don, turn your head to the right. There you go. The first live television transmission from a spacecraft to the nation's television audience occurred at 10.43 Eastern Daylight Time on the morning of the fourth day. High atop everything. something. High atop everything. Looks good. I can see Wally handle it now. And Don has a smile on his face and there's Walt. Well. Tom, you can look at it better on your TV. It's more accurate on your little tube. Now the destination is pretty good down here. I can see the center hatch. It look, actually, I'm amazed. It looks real good. The low power transmissions from the spacecraft were received by S-band stations at Corpus Christi and Kennedy Space Center, where special equipment converted the images for reception on home television sets. Seven television transmissions from space were presented by the crew during the Apollo 7 mission. No problems with getting around as zero G as long as you're out of those suits. The work done is almost zero. And on the sixth day, the first of two minimum impulse SPS burns was performed. This fourth burn of the engine lasted about one half second. Other activities on the sixth day included a propellant slosh damping test, star count test, and landmark tracking. As they passed over the Gulf of Mexico, the crew reported the position of Hurricane Gladys, which was moving towards the southwest coast of Florida. The fifth SPS burn tested the propulsion system and its propellant and gauging systems. Manual takeover control of the burn by the crew was also demonstrated. The test took place on the seventh day and lasted 67 seconds, increasing velocity by 1,692 feet per second and raising the apogee to the high point of 245 miles above Earth. Mid-course navigation and window photography tests were also conducted by the crew during the seventh day. The second minimum impulse burn took place on the ninth day. This was also a half second burn. Additional star count tests and the second lunar module rendezvous radar test were conducted on the ninth day. SPS burn number seven at nine days, 23 hours and six minutes into the flight was a true anomaly adjustment of the location of perigee. This assured landing in the primary recovery zone in the Atlantic Ocean and set up the proper orbital conditions for performing a backup deorbit maneuver if necessary. Earth photography was one of the last activities performed by the crew prior to the deorbit maneuver on the 11th day of the mission. The eighth and final SPS burn was a 350 feet per second retrograde reorbit maneuver at 10 days, 19 hours and 39 minutes. Due to congestion from head colds, the crew elected to re-enter with their helmets stowed. Command module separation, parachute deployment, and other re-entry events were nominal. Splashdown occurred within one mile of the guidance system target point at 7.12 Eastern Daylight Time on October 22nd. Recovery of the crew and spacecraft was delayed by the fact that the spacecraft landed in a stable two or apex down attitude with its radio antenna underwater. The uprighting system functioned normally to return the command module to the upright stable one attitude. The crew was picked up by a recovery helicopter and were safe aboard the USS Essex 
less than an hour after splashdown. All primary Apollo 7 mission objectives and detailed test objectives were completely accomplished. For the first manned Apollo flight, crew comfort and safety were enhanced for the first time by a change in cabin atmosphere in flight, hot meals, and relatively complete freedom of motion in the spacecraft. Engineering first included live television from space and drinking water produced as a byproduct of the fuel cells. The service module SPS engine proved itself by accomplishing the longest and shortest manned SPS burns and the largest number of in-flight restarts. Navigation and control achievements included full optical rendezvous, manual launch vehicle attitude control, and orbital determination by sextant tracking of another vehicle by spacecraft. Apollo 7 proved the capabilities of the command and service modules, the crew, and the manned space flight support facilities. The outstanding success of the Apollo 7 mission paved the way for future Apollo manned missions, leading toward the Apollo lunar landing. <laughs>